to another seminar in the 2020 Monash Biomedical Imaging Webinar Series. And I'm uh, Associate Professor Michael Farrell, and I'm going to be your host today. And I wish to acknowledge the uh, people of the Kulin Nations on whose land Monash University is positioned. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Um, on a housekeeping matter, if, if you'd like to ask uh, any questions about presenters today, uh, please do. But uh, submit those questions uh, uh, through the little uh, Q&A window and uh, I'll, I'll uh, pass them on to the speakers at the conclusion of their presentations. And now it's my honour uh, to introduce our speakers. Uh, firstly, uh, uh, Dr. Ian Harding, who's a Senior Research Fellow and Head of the Mechanisms of Neurodegeneration Lab in the uh, Monash University uh, Department of Neuroscience and Monash Biomedical Imaging. Um, after obtaining his PhD from the University of Melbourne in 2013, Ian's forged an impressive international profile as a key player in the Enigma Ataxia Working Group. Um, the investigation of rare diseases presents unique challenges and Ian's efforts in his chosen field are a case study in how to grow knowledge when access to data is constrained. Uh, joining Ian uh, in this joint presentation is Dr. Luisa Salvadare. And Luisa uh, has been, uh, up until relatively recently, a Doctor of Psychology student in the stream of clinical neuropsychology within the Turner uh, Institute for Brain and Mental Health. And she's in that exciting transition period at the moment between the conclusion of her PhD and the commencement of a postdoctoral position in Ian's lab. And so I invite Louisa to uh, share her screen to kick us off and hand over uh, to Ian to set the scene as he and Louisa speak to multimodal and multi-site imaging in rare disease a spotlight on Friedrich's ataxia. Thank you very much, Michael, and good afternoon, everyone. So we've got Louisa's screen up there, okay? <clears throat> good. So I'm just gonna kick off with a very brief introduction and I'll pass off to Louisa um, who can uh, talk to one element of our research and then I'll come back and talk to a, a second element. So we'll give you a bit of a snapshot of, uh, of some of the things that we're doing. Um, so, if you could get that next slide, Louisa. Thank you. So, there's a lot of challenges, as we know, in in neuroimaging field, not specific to rare diseases, um, around um, inference. Uh, so, inferential challenges in neuroimaging that affect us all, but that are often magnified or compounded in rare diseases because of the small sample sizes that we um, that 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 we are working with. And so some of these challenges include biological or mechanistic inference, and that's really relating imaging features back to the underlying neuropathology of the disease. So how do we make that transition between the two? Another challenge is uh, power and reliability of inference. We know we've all heard about the replication um, uh, crisis, uh, in, particularly in neuroimaging, um, in, in other fields as well. And a lot of that relates to ensuring that our studies are appropriately powered and allowing robust estimation of effect sizes. And the third challenge that we often face in pathology and understanding pathology is disease variability. And we know that even in a single gene disease, one of which that we'll, uh, we'll present to you today, there is a lot of uh, heterogeneity in the manifestation of the illness as well as the progression of the illness. So just by way of example, those images right down there on the bottom are actually both VBM studies of uh, gray matter atrophy in Friedrich ataxia in different groups. Um, and you can see there that there's clearly no overlap in the findings. As we, if we dig into that deeper, um, I won't go into the details, but the, the, the sample characteristics are actually surprisingly different um, across those two groups. And so these are things that we need to be aware of. So if we go to the next slide, um, there's a couple of approaches that we can consider to mitigate some of these challenges, certainly not to get rid of them, but to try to address them. 
And so approach number one is thinking about how we can collect and, and integrate complementary data across different modalities. And whether that's different MR modalities, different imaging techniques, potentially adding fluid biomarkers into the story. It's all about trying to leverage the unique and shared biological information that's provided by different measures to improve that level of mechanistic inference as well as um, the reliability of the conclusions that we're drawing. And the second is around trying to collect larger samples and or better defined cohorts to really focus on either targeted subgroups or to be getting a broad representation of illness across a large sample. So I'm going to pass off to Louisa, who's going to be talking a little bit about some of the work we do um, in approach one, integrating information um, or in, in, integrating multiple uh, modalities to understand white matter deficits in Friedrichataxia. And then I'll come back and talk about approach number two around trying to get to, to leverage more and more, more data to, to improve robustness of our, uh, of our outcomes. So Louisa, okay. um, take it away. All right. Thank you, Ian. Um, so, um, as Ian mentioned, I'll be focusing on challenge number one, um, with some work from my doctoral thesis. Um, and just to start off, I will give everyone a, a brief overview of free drug ataxia and how our neuroimaging work within our group is trying to contribute towards um, better outcomes for people living with this disease. Um, so, free drug ataxia is a recessively inherited and progressive disorder. It is um, a rare disorder and it has a typical onset between the ages of 10 and 15 years old. So the um, genetic mutation associated with this um, disorder is a repeat expansion in chromosome 9, and the, the key um, consequence of this um, genetic difference is reduced production of a protein called protaxin, which is a mitochondrial protein. This leads to dysfunction in um, cells and pathology in a number of tissues throughout the body, Within the nervous system, which is our focus, the peripheral and central nervous system are affected. And within the central nervous system, um, the, the, the key pathology is in the spinal cord and the dentate nucleus in terms of what we might see in histology. Um, but as what we do in our research, um, there are a number of um, interesting um, findings to do with the cerebrum as well. These areas of pathology produce um, some characteristic symptoms cardinally a progressive movement in coordination and also speech difficulties and some other symptoms as well. And needless to say, these really impact people's daily functioning. In terms of the research pipelines in free drug ataxia, there is currently no effective treatment for this life-limiting and life-shortening illness. And there are a number of ongoing pharmaceutical trials and research in different domains um, trying to work towards um, some sort of treatment or better outcomes and management. So there's research across all of the different areas, such as genetics, histology, symptoms, and, and clinical studies. And where um, human neuroimaging comes in, in our work, um, sort of sits between the tissue pathology and the symptom side of things. So we're able to look in, you know, the in vivo um, tissue, the types of um, differences between people with free drug ataxia and controls. And um, as Ian mentioned, trying to get a bit more uh, information towards working out potential disease mechanisms. We can also look at how these um, imaging features relate to symptoms and clinical expression, and we could also um, look at how they might be used to mark um, clinical progression as a biomarker. So that just gives you some context to our work. So now I'll present um, some cross-sectional work from my doctoral thesis which is looking at a multimodal approach to characterizing white matter in free drug ataxia. And this is now part of a published study um, with the reference here, which is in the journal Human Brain Mapping. So the background to this study was that um, there is consistent evidence of fairly widespread disruption to the white matter within, within the brain in free drug ataxia. And when we look at the literature, there are a number of measures reported when looking at white matter. There are some microstructural measures, um, which include things like diffusion metrics, which um, are based on the diffusion of water in brain tissue. I've just listed some of them here. We've also got a magnetization transfer ratio, which is another modality. And we've also got macrostructure in which white matter volume is um, quantified. 
So as part of the literature review in my thesis, um, I produced this paper, which is in Neuroscience and Biobehavioral Reviews, and I had a look at these various white matter metrics and different um, areas of white matter and what the effect was um, in various studies. And as you can see, there are a number of studies showing um, either increases or decreases in these variables in different studies. Some studies show changes in multiple variables. Some studies show different directions of effects to other variables and so on. So in this context, we wanted to try and understand a little bit more about um, what it means that all of these um, measures are reported. In particular, do different measures reflect the same or do they reflect unique characteristics of the disease process? And also, can we further investigate how these measures are related to learn a bit more about potential disease mechanisms, given that these different measures have been associated with different aspects of white matter pathology? So this work came from the Friedrich Ataxia study, which was um, a two-year follow-up study conducted out of Monash University and Monash Biomedical Imaging. Um, today, I'll be focusing on the baseline portion of the study, where we had um, about 36 individuals with Friedrich Ataxia and matched control who undertook um, a number of neuroimaging sequences. And the ones I listed here are what I'm going to be speaking about today. The methods used here um, that I'm going to talk about are firstly, a whole brain voxel-based analysis of white matter to identify differences between the free drug ataxia and control groups. And we use these six different white matter measures um, all together and looking at different patterns that we could find between all of these six measures. Now the first five in blue are our microstructural measures. And when we did the group comparison, we controlled for volume to see if there were any uh, microstructural effects over and above any volume differences. Secondly, we looked at what we call spatial correlations in selected regions of interest. So we had some regions of interest in the brain and for each voxel in those regions, we looked at the group differences in fractional anisotropy and the group difference in one of the other metrics. And we correlated these group differences or these disease effects to see um, if we can identify some patterns in how these disease effects across metrics are related to each other. Here's the findings from my first analysis of the between group difference. The colored regions show um, voxels in the brain where there was a significant between group difference. Um, based on a cluster-based analysis. And the, uh, the warmer colors indicate higher um, effect sizes. So I'll just point out some key features here. Uh, we've got our diffusion metrics, and we do see that by and large, there is fairly widespread um, areas of group difference in these metrics. We've also got the magnetization transfer ratio, which is a bit more restricted in terms of group difference to um, cerebellar regions. And lastly, I've got volume, which was again restricted to um, cerebellar brain stem and thalamic region. So you're already seeing a bit of a difference in some of the um, spatial extent of these group differences between these different metrics. For my spatial correlations, I'll just take you um, through what we're seeing here. Um, the different rows are different regions of interest which we selected based on areas of white matter that have been reported as being um, abnormal in free drag ataxia in previous work. And these cloud of dots, each dot represents a voxel in the brain. So we're correlating group differences in one metric against group differences in another metric um, across all voxels. And um, I'll just point out a couple of key patterns here. One thing that we did find that was quite interesting was we had a look at some of these cerebellar traps, which um, here are the superior, middle, and inferior cerebellar peduncles. Um, we saw that there was some um, particular correlations um, looking at um, some um, magnetization transfer ratio differences against fractional anisotropy differences. Whereas when you looked at the cerebral tracts here in blue, there was more of a correlation with axial diffusivity differences. And this is sort of interesting to point out because um, these two uh, metrics, the magnetization transfer ratio and axial diffusivity have been sort of um, provisionally associated with different aspects of white matter pathology, um, myelin deficits and axonal pathology um, respectively. 
So what we're just pointing out here is that there were cerebellar versus cerebral tracts that seem to have different mechanisms potentially driving the white matter pathology in those tracts. So just to sum up here, um, the key findings from this work was that the widespread white matter differences in free drug ataxia um, that we found in previous literature and that we've replicated in this work likely result from multiple pathophysiological processes. So we saw that there were, for example, volume differences. And additionally, over and above that, there were um, microstructural differences in other parts of the brain. We also found that when we use different MRI modalities and measures together, we can see that they contribute different information about the disease process. And it's quite useful to actually consider their interrelationship together. Um, the spatial correlation work that I just presented provides some preliminary evidence for potential distinction between the mechanisms which underlie um, white matter pathology in cerebellar tracts on one hand versus cerebral tracts on the other hand. And you know, we might ask questions from this such as, is, is one of these more of a primary pathology and one more secondary pathology? And it's something that could be um, further distinguished in histological and preclinical studies that really are able to look at the tissue itself. And just to sort of say that this single site work with you know, a relatively um, small sample, not small for free drug ataxia, but limited in that it was a single site, um, in this way can help generate hypotheses for future research. So by pointing out the potential difference between the cerebellar and cerebral tract, um, this can help us generate hypotheses and analysis plans for larger studies, such as those that Ian will speak about now. I'll hand over to Ian. Thank you, Louise. I'll go off mute. Um, I'll just find my presentation here, flip that. Hopefully this is seamless. And I think that that's you know, a wonderful example of, let's get that started. Wonderful example of how we can leverage off of using multiple information um, and in, and within an individual. So looking at an individual and, and trying to take a deeper dive um, or a cohort of individuals and taking a deeper dive. I'm going to change tack a little bit and introduce you to the other approach that we talked about in dealing with some of the challenges, which is trying to aggregate not more information per subject, but more information across subjects or, or a greater number of subjects. So um, we uh, had a look at the, 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 the data recently um, and working in this field and recognize that, okay, Friedrich is a rare disease as Louisa was talking about and, and therefore necessarily a lot of single site neuroimaging studies are, are performed in small cohorts. The first cohort level studies in, in this disease were um, published in 2008, so actually not that long ago. And over the last 12 years, there's been, um, uh, from a literature review, 22 MRI studies in Friedrich Hytaxia, with the, the medium cohort size being 21 individuals with FA um, and, and a comparable size control group, and the max being uh, 37, and that's actually some of our work as well as some Brazilian work. Um, and, and this has been aggregated across 12, uh, there's about 12 research groups around the world that are working on these types of questions. So we recognize an opportunity to try to do things more robustly by bringing together as many of these research groups as we could. So we teamed up a couple of years ago with the Enigma um, Consortium. And, and many of you are probably familiar with Enigma, which is a broad worldwide consortium that aims to aggregate MRI data from across a, a large number of people um, and in a large number of, of diseases. And so there's um, quite a few 40 plus, maybe 50 plus um, semi-autonomous working groups now available in Enigma. And we launched the Ataxia um, working group a couple of years ago. And what that has led to is that we've been able to aggregate data from about 250 people with uh, FA and uh, about 260 healthy controls from across 10 different sites. And so in the rare disease community, this is big data. Um, so it's, it's not big data in you know, schizophrenia where the schizophrenia working group I think has 20 or 30,000 scans, but we're, we are still working at an order of magnitude greater to improve the robustness of some of the inference that we're able to draw. So using this data as a first pass, we undertook a voxel-based morphometry study of atrophy um, using the T1-weighted images. 
Um, and I won't be, be, belabor this, this is just kind of the snapshot of the main findings that we had. And in many ways, it recapitulates what, we, uh, what, what Louisa was showing and what we know about the disease in terms of the primary atrophies occurring in deep cerebellar regions, as well as the output um, uh, tracks and the input, tra output tracks from the cerebellum and input tracks into the cerebellum. There's also a lot more happening in terms of the cerebral white matter than we were previously aware of. But one thing I do want to highlight is actually what's happening in the cerebrum. And this is important because to this point, the cerebral cortex is generally thought to be anatomically spared. Certainly all of the textbooks suggest that that's the case. And in, in terms of primary literature, there's been a couple of studies here and there that have suggested some atrophy that may be occurring, other studies that have suggested against, and it was, it's been quite equivocal to this point in time. But what we've been able to show here by aggregating the larger amount of data across these various sites is that there certainly is relatively subtle but consistent reductions in, um, uh, in, in volume, particularly within the primary motor and uh, somatosensory cortices. I've actually overlaid, so these, these are the same results here, I've just overlaid them onto the Brainatome Atlas, and that allows us to be pulling out a few, a bit finer, a bit more finer grain detail in terms of where those areas of ma maximal atrophy are occurring. And that's uh, specifically in the upper limb and lower limb areas of the, um, of the motor cort cortex and the somatosensory cortex, which maps on to what we know about the disease manifestation. And so we can see here in the forest plot that there are, there is some variability across studies, but in aggregate, we can actually answer the question pretty clearly that yes, something definitely is happening in the, in the, in the cerebral cortex, and we can advance our knowledge of, of the disease, um, the, the neurobiology of the disease. The other and potentially uh, more exciting thing that we can do is actually start to understand disease staging. And so when we have a large cohort that, uh, our large cohort does uh, uh, encompass a substantial cross-section of disease stages, we can actually start to subgroup to understand, first of all, the temporal profile of the disease. Um, and as you can see here, what we've done is we've taken the data and divided it up into um, different uh, periods of time. So the first 10 years, the first decade, second decade, and third decade, um, or beyond the third decade of a disease manifestation. And we can see fairly clearly here that there is um, early uh, atrophy that's occurring in the um, in primary disease areas, again, in the cerebellum and in the brainstem, and that progresses uh, with the disease uh, continuation, with the disease progression. There's a lesser effect in the cerebral gray matter, or sorry, cerebellar gray matter early on in the disease, but that really picks up pace as the disease progresses as well. There's not a whole lot happening in the cerebrum early. We're starting to see some uh, thalamic effects in particular coming into, into play, um, particularly starting in the second decade. And then your, the cerebral cortical areas um, are, are becoming more impacted as quite a late stage disease related effect. When we, we can flip this coin a little bit and actually look at disease stratification. And we know clinically that the age at disease onset plays a pretty significant role in the rate of progression, as well as some of the actual symptoms that manifest in the disease. So there's a distinction and the, and the onset age of the disease actually directly related to the genetic abnormality as well. Um, so just, just glossing over some of the details. So longer trip that repeat expansion um, leads to greater um, suppression of the frataxin protein expression, which leads to earlier onset of the disease. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what we can see here, though, is if we stratify by what we would say would be a, a typical onset, so onset uh, around or prior to uh, puberty, at onset in late adolescence or early adulthood, and then a late onset um, in, uh, in, in, in adulthood um, uh, uh, proper, that we can actually see that there's quite a different pattern um, of uh, atrophy, or potentially not pattern of atrophy, but certainly magnitude of atrophy, where uh, in uh, the uh, primary disease areas, as well as in this cerebellar cortex, um, when we control for age and dur duration, um, the later onset is associated with less severe neuro uh, neuropathology or neuroanatomical differences. So taken together, 
Um, and it's actually nine subgroups. I was just pulling out some, some sub examples um, to, to, to show you. We can actually see that this would never be possible in a group of 20 people or 30 people. But when we have this sample that we're able to start to break down, it allows us to indicate that it's actually quite important to recognize the stratification of the neurobiology by onset age, as well as the temporal evolution, both for research purposes and research comparisons between studies, as well as for therapeutic trials where the treatment targets and <clears throat> the potential outcome biomarkers of a treatment may be quite a bit different for different subgroups of the disease. So with that, I'd just like to thank uh, both for um, the work that Louisa was talking about, as well as this work, our, our collaborators here at Monash and at the uh, Children's uh, at the Murdoch um, across the river, as well as the larger Enigma um, Ataxia Consortium and our funding sources. And, uh, and thank you for your attention. Um, thank you very much. Ian and Louisa. So now I'd, I'd like to open up uh, for any questions that anyone would like to ask. Perhaps while you're thinking of that, perhaps I can pose one. Because um, you intimated that, um, uh, that some of the changes that you were characterising may be primarily a consequence of the disorder itself and others might be um, further downstream perhaps. Um, as secondary uh, aspects. Do you, do, do you think that as a whole, the data, given that you've got some of this longitudinal information and, and seemingly differ, differential um, mechanisms contributing, do you think there is a, a coherent picture that's consistent with that view of, of, of a disease that first manifests in a particular region and then has more widespread distributed effects? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an excellent question and it's something that we think about, we've thought about quite a bit. Um, I, the, there's also, I mean, there's primary versus secondary and then um, not to, to complicate the story, there's also probably developmental versus degenerative um, aspects that, that are occurring as well. But in terms of the primary versus secondary, I think we can go back to the neuropathological literature, which suggests very clearly that there are primary sites in which the frataxin deficit leads to a, a degeneration of that tissue or abnormality in the, in the metabolic activity in, in, in those tissues. And that's in the brain, it's the dentate nucleus of the cerebellum and then the dorsal root ganglia in, in the spinal cord. And then I think that's, because those are early features that we're seeing in the imaging as well, it seems to map well onto that. Whereas some of the other features, particularly the cerebral abnormalities, do seem to be coming about progressively with um, uh, in increasing degeneration or, or, or longevity of the illness, which is suggestive that and it would make sense that degeneration that's occurring in one area has that secondary consequence that's occurring elsewhere. We, we also see some interesting functional profile, for example, where in the cerebellum, as, as the function of the cerebellum is decreasing um, with the pathology in the cerebrum, we actually see early compensatory activity that's coming into play to mitigate that before that falls away as well, which is also then suggestive of a primary um, uh, disease-related effect in, in cerebellum um, and that uh, the cerebrum is trying to account for that early on, but um, that, that's having a secondary, the, the progression of the disease is having a secondary impact on that over, over time. Okay. Um, well, since I've, oh, here we go. I, um, it looks oh, like I have some questions here I can uh, put to you in from our audience. Oh, but first I'll allow Gary the opportunity to. Yeah, thank you very much, Louisa and Ed. A really fascinating talk. Um, Louisa, I was intrigued with the plot you showed of the correlations between axial diffusivity, fractional anisotropy, radial, and MTR, and it's obviously a complex story. And um, you know, the crux of it, really, I, I wanted to ask you was, is, do you think it's possible to identify different types of white matter pathologies using the different white matter MRI metrics? Can you try and infer with MTR or maybe the radial diffusivity or both aspects of demyelination? Do you think the um, axial diffusivity measure tells you something more about axonal degeneration 
And, and if so, do you think there's value in further studies here to, for example, use techniques like Noddy and try and go a step further and really probe the microstructure of these white matter changes in, in previous ataxia? Thanks, Gary, for the question. It's a really good question. I think the measures that I've presented here, um, none of these are direct measures of, of the tissue and of, of myelin and, and things like that. Um, they look at different ways in which the water is moving in the tissue, and then we infer as a proxy measure um, what might be happening at the tissue level. And, and of course, it's all um, information where we get values at each voxel, whereas the actual axons and the myelin is, is much of a sub-voxel um, tissue type. So none of these are our direct measurements, but what we do think that we can do based on other literature which associates these different metrics with different aspects of tissue pathology through animal studies and so on, we can get some sort of primarily primary inference or speculation about the types of relationships that are happening. So for example, one of my conclusions was potentially um, the cerebellar versus cerebral tracts may have different mechanisms in terms of one seems more associated with maybe the more myelin related metrics and one more with the axonal degeneration related metrics. And that's purely based on um, you know, animal studies and other studies that have been those associations. But it would really need to have another level of analysis um, to really make those firm conclusions. And, and I, I mentioned some things like preclinical and tissue pathology studies, but um, as you mentioned, there are now more advanced magnetic resonance imaging techniques, which are, I believe, getting closer to um, that sort of inference. So things like um, water content, being able to look at um, further details of myelin and also with increased magnetic field strength as well. I think it's, it's potentially becoming possible to get a bit further than what my study did. Okay, thank you, Louisa. Um, I have a question uh, from Zhao Lin Shen. Um, around a technical issue. So um, how did you control site-specific image quality differences uh, due to MRI protocol variation and so on when you did your group analyses? Yep, um, excellent question. And obviously with retrospective data aggregation, the, this is something that we need to consider um, relatively closely. Um, and so thankfully, a lot of uh, really people who are smarter than I am um, uh, within the Enigma Consortium has been help helping us out with some of these questions. But the answer is actually, um, in, in our case, we have control groups that exist from each of the, uh, from each of the individual sites. And so that we're actually able to just um, model site effects in the in the statistical model in the GLM um, uh, when we're modeling it. So we include site as a covariate um, as well as a group by site interaction effects as a covariate to try to explain away those. Um, it come, becomes a little bit more tricky when we're looking at correlations, disease-related correlations, uh, which I didn't show you the data for, but um, linear correlations with onset age or with duration or with disease severity. And with that, we actually took the control data from each of the sites um, and used that to normalize the subject data. So we literally subtracted away the average control signal from the, from the patient, from each of the patients. And then the other thing we did was we know that disease duration um, and severity correlates quite highly with age. Um, and so we estimated the age related effect in the control groups and again adjusted the patient data to account for any um, age related variability. So uh, it's as, as simple as either accounting for it in a statistical model or actually trying to harmonize the data a little bit more leveraging off of the control data that we have from each site. Thanks, Ian. I have a question from uh, Laura Bird, uh, a slightly different uh, perspective. Do you have data to be able to assess potential differences in psychosocial outcomes between different subgroups? For example, do the earlier onset groups have worse quality of life, psychiatric comorbidities, etc.? You want to touch on that, Louisa? I think one. This one is relating to the different subgroups. Um, presented, um, but there is um, a lot of separate literature, um, a lot of which is done through Melbourne as well, looking at the natural history of free drag ataxia and looking at um, quality of life, um, functional abilities throughout the course of the disease. So what we do know is that um, 
people's you know functional abilities and, and things like that do decline across the disease course um, which matches the disease progression so this might look like something like they may progress from being able to walk um, without any assistance to using a two-wheel frame to then using a wheelchair so we do see that increased severity over the course of the disease as you may expect in terms of the earlier onset group um, what we do know is that people with an earlier onset, so which means that the disease starts at a younger age, they do have a more severe progression of the illness compared to those who, um, you know, get the diagnosis or have the onset of symptoms relatively later in life. Um, so it's a really good point to bring up because the severity and the impact on that person's life and also with an early impact during the developmental phase um, obviously does result in a, a different experience and different psychosocial factors with those groups. So I think it's really important to consider. I'm not sure if there was a specific analysis in, um, in subgroup work, um, but it's a very important point to bring up. Okay, thank you very much, Louisa. Um, Gary, um, would you like to pose another question? I do have another question, um, this time for Ian. I thought they were beautiful maps you showed us, Ian, from the Enigma Ataxia um, consortium work um, and I wondered if you thought it would be feasible to try and collect um, diffusion data from these sites or whether there are many sites with diffusion data uh, that you could start to look at some of these white matter pathologies in this larger group that'd be fascinating yeah yes yes and yes um, so um, for anybody on the call who is looking for a postdoc um, at the moment uh, this is you've just cued me actually Gary we are currently <laughs> hiring um, applications are due actually in the next couple of days for somebody to help us to analyze further data or develop pipelines for analyzing further data in Enigma ataxia, as well as cerebellum, cerebellum analyses across the Enigma consortium more widely, because um, this is obviously has great relevance to, um, to other diseases as well. So some of our um, next steps will include uh, diffusion, uh, diffusion imaging. There will be less data available, but still certainly, um, even if it's only five or six sites, Sites, um, much, much greater than what has been done on an individual site basis to this point in time. We're also running a spinal cord analysis um, where we can actually take the brain T1s and understand cross-sectional area of the spinal cord, of the upper spinal cord. Um, and, uh, and we'll be looking into uh, longitudinal analyses as well. So uh, lots of exciting things to come. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, so watch, watch this space for further Enigma analyses, Enigma ataxy analyses. It's my understanding, Ian, that most of the Enigma analyses are based on T1 images, and so they're looking at structure. Uh, are there many Enigma consortia which have used uh, diffusion imaging data and start to look at white matter microstructure? Yeah, in fact, the, I, mean, I showed you the, the list of working groups for disease diseases. There's actually a, a, a rapidly increasing number of working groups for different modalities as well. So diffusion is, is, has been implemented. Um, some of the major psychiatric uh, working groups, uh, schizophrenia, major depression, OCD, anxiety, I believe that they've published um, their white matter papers uh, already. Uh, that's work that's being led by uh, Neda Jahanshad um, out of USC. Um, so first one uh, was, I think, about a year and a half ago that came out. There's also efforts to standardize resting state fMRI, task-based fMRI. There's a spectroscopy working group. Um, so uh, brain age um, and other machine learning techniques. So I think there's a lot of really exciting work that's being done to try to leverage other modalities um, and, uh, and retrospective big data aggregation. Right. Thanks, Anna. Well, thank you very much, Ian. It's clearly a very exciting field to work in um, and you've um, you know, benefited from those international connections that the Enigma Working Group provides. It's, it's uh, a yeah, very good presentation. Thank you very much, Louisa, too, for your excellent contribution. And so I, I just, in words, want to applaud you in the absence of actual applause um, and, and thank you very much for your presentations. And that concludes our session today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much.